Philip Haney is a counterterrorism expert. The former officer with the Department of Homeland Security is the author of See Something, Say Nothing. The whistleblower tells us how the records of Muslims with terrorist ties were deleted by the Obama administration and how the government is submitting to jihad. How many here support missionaries overseas in some way or another? Have you ever had a missionary come and speak to you? You have, just now. You have people from Iran who lived it, and you have a person from Egypt. Both of them are now citizens of our country. They're coming to tell us what they saw firsthand. Now you know what it feels like to be on the receiving end of a missionary. An American who goes to a foreign country is received in exactly the same way as Annie and Usama. Are you going to receive what they say? The question I'm sure in all of our minds will be, well, what are we supposed to do about it? Right? Is it? What is Sharia law? Actually, let me back up. What is the actual threat that we face? And let me back up even further from that. What are you all here independently and individually and sometimes in groups, what are you fighting against? Can someone tell me what you're fighting against? Okay. Anybody else? Just call out. What are you fighting against? Good. All good things. Now please tell me what are we fighting for? Liberty. Constitution. You're on my team, on the Intel team, right over there. That is what we're actually fighting for. Why? Because if you say you're fighting for liberty, whose liberty are you fighting for? If you say you're fighting for freedom, then whose freedom are you actually fighting for? Illinois version? Wisconsin version? Minnesota version? Iowa? Maybe. But it's not specific enough, is it? What is our country based on? What is our found, the foundation of our country? We hold these truths to be self-evident that God, the Creator, has endowed us with unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that the Creator instituted government among men, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, in order to preserve the liter liberties that He endowed us with. Which means by default, if we say we believe in the Creator, we are obligated by duty to be participants in the government that the Lord Himself instituted in order to protect the liberties that He gave us. I won't say the word stupid. However, what is it if you're too short-sighted and don't even have the wherewithal to recognize that you're a participant in the government that was created or instituted by the government, the Lord himself, in order to simply protect you from chaos and violence? Do you know what the primary duty of the federal government is according to the Constitution? to protect the states from outbreaks of civil violence. Did you know that? And or to protect the country from foreign evasion. Invasion, those are the two, actually foreign evasion too, now that I think about it, like the Iran deal. That's a good example of foreign evasion. The Constitution is there to protect the country from foreign invasion and the federal government's primary responsibility is protect each state from civil unrest. Are they doing it? So what is the threat? Is it terrorism? No, that's a tactic. What is the threat? The threat is the strategy of the global Islamic movement, which according to its own definition, Sharia law is superior to all man-made forms of law. I said all, underlined, italicized, and emphasize, including the U.S. Constitution. By its own definition, Sharia law is, is, will be, forever superior to all forms of man-made law, including the Constitution. That is the gravitational force that drives the entire global Islamic movement, not jihad. Jihad is a tactic. And as long as we don't recognize the distinction between the strategy, which is the goal of the global Islamic movement, and the tactics that we, they will use to implement it, we will lose. 
because we're putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable, right? If you fight tactics, anybody here shoot? What are you supposed to do with the target? You acquire it and you aim in, right? And you move with the target. What will happen if you shoot all rounds down range while the target is moving? You're wasting your ammo, aren't you? That's tactical. But what if you know that this moving target's intention or go, uh, final position will be right over there by that door? This moving target, rather than shooting rounds downrange and missing, why not just go over to the door and wait for it to come? That's the difference between strategy and tactics. Our foreign policy has been based primarily on addressing tactics and not addressing the strategy. It is a fatal error. All the losses that we have suffered in the Middle East since the 9-11 are primarily because we don't understand the difference between strategy and tactics. And now we're about to go back over and do it again in Afghanistan. Whereas did you know, for example, that there is Al-Qaeda number three now? The shattered remnants of the original Al-Qaeda, which, by the way, wasn't just Al Osama bin Laden. It was five sheikhs and 12 organizations coalesced into an organization that we know of commonly as Al-Qaeda. ISIS, that we hear about so much, was another step above that. ISIS, at the current time, has a coalition of 35 different organizations and I don't know exactly how many sheikhs, qadis, and mahdis and leaders there are in the organizational structure of the global network we hear so often called ISIS. Now they've formed a third coalition. And I'm going to give you a homework assignment. I want you to listen carefully on the news and see when the first time will be that you hear of this new organization which is called AQIS, Al-Qaeda of the Indian Subcontinent. Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. Have we been hearing about Myanmar lately? The Rohingyas, the poor persecuted Rohingyas. You know that there are jihadis seeking to subvert the government of Burma? AQIS, Al-Qaeda of the Indian subcontinent, has now coalesced into a macro-global organization. And if you want to hear what their intentions are, I should say, read, they've been very kind to produce it in English, well-written, it's called the Code of Conduct. AQIS, Code of Conduct. It is the most clearly written, precise, in English, briefing on the strategy and tactics of the global Islamic movement that I have read in my entire professional career, which I have been doing since the middle of the 70s. When I used to work in the, in the Middle East as an entomologist, anybody, everybody know what an entomologist is? It's a nerd. <laughs> I, we patented, the, us entomologists patented the white lab coat, the clipboard, and the pen holder. We own the patents on that. But then I see, my cruise control personality is 50% Clark Kent and 30% Steve Martin because you know humor is still legal and we should use it while we can, right? But I have 20% Chuck Norris. If uh, I couldn't have been an armed federal law enforcement officer and wear a gun for a living if I didn't have at least some streak of Chuck Norris, could I? No. AQIS published, it's called Dawa, means promotion of Islam. They are required according to Sharia law to tell us exactly what they intend to do. It's a requirement. They published it in well-written English, a 20-page briefing called the Code of Conduct. And at the top of the list of strategic goals is to kill Americans and Israelis wherever they find them, just like what the verse that he wrote. Terrorize them wherever you find them. That tells you it's deliberate and intentional. It's not arbitrary or accidental. When you look for somebody until you find them, that is direct, deliberate and intentional action.
follow. Is that correct? It's not accidental. Please go online, look it up, and read it. And if you have any questions, you can email uh, any of the three of us we're capable of addressing the Quranic and Hadith-based strategy and tactics in the AQIS Code of Conduct. There is no remaining facade, no more pretense, no more warm-ups, no more preliminaries, no more dress rehearsals. Al-Qaeda has now merged into a global macro organization. It's going to suck in jihadi Islamists from all over the world. And what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Now I'm going to connect my story. But before I do that, what is Sharia law, by the way? If you only know one thing about Sharia, the stuff about women is bad enough. But the one thing that if you don't know anything else about Sharia at all, you should realize that according to Sharia law, to leave Islam is a death sentence. There is no freedom of religion in Islam. If you are an apostate, you have a mark on the middle of your forehead, and they will kill you. The only places that you have the luxury of surviving not being a Salafi Muslim is in a liberal country like America where you have the freedom of religion. But there's a dark shadow coming over our country, and it's called Sharia. That's the threat. The other side of the threat, of course, is the progressive movement that wants to shatter the constitutional republic that we're based on. And people ask me over and over, why are they doing it? And I can tell you it's in the Declaration of Independence that when a government becomes tyrannical, it is the right and the duty of the populace to alter or abolish the current form of government and replace it with one that is more suitable to their worldview. Alter or abolish is also known as hope and change. They are seeking to alter or abolish the current form of government and replace it with one. The progressive leftists have their own definition, whereas the Islamic have their own definition too, and that's why they're natural allies. But I will tell you now, the green will always eat the red because the reds don't know what they believe. They're willing to allow other people to die for what they say they believe, but they don't actually have a defined strategy and tactic, whereas Islam does, and that's why they will always devour the progressive left. They're much more dangerous because they know what they believe. So what is the threat? The implementation of Sharia law. So the bottom line is, there are three arenas, social, political, and law enforcement. Each one of you is going to be drawn to one of those three arenas. Social arena trigger point is immigration reform. Look at how much trouble we're having reforming our immigration policy. That is in the social arena, diversity and inclusion. We're going to make this country more diverse and inclusive, whether you like it or not. It's a social experiment. The second one is the political arena, and the flashpoint for that is going to be whether or not we have the sovereign right to establish an embassy in Jerusalem. Of all things, you say, how in the world would that be the indicator? Because the whole world is telling us that we do not have the sovereign right to establish an embassy in the city of Jerusalem with our best ally in the Middle East, and if we do it, we will be de they will declare war on us and attack us. And the third arena is law enforcement. And the flashpoint for that one is going to be the designation of the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. Whether we do it or whether we don't do it will be an indicator whether we have the wherewithal to recover our country or not. Promise you, write them down and keep them in mind. Think about what I said tonight. I was a founding member of the Department of Homeland Security. I was there from the very first literal day. I saw like new corn in the spring. Everybody here knows about new corn in the spring, don't you? And I saw it spring up from the ground, and I saw it mature into what it is today. I was there. I saw all of it. And I got into an inordinate amount of trouble because I picked the two particular organizations that are posing the greatest threat to the national security of our country, the Muslim Brotherhood and a group called Tablighi Jamaat which means the party of the promoters. It comes out of the Indian subcontinent, the very place that I just told you about, AQIS. 
So even though the U.S. government shut the case down, I was right. And that's why I'm standing here today. I just got back from Israel, and I found out that the people in that part of the region see Americans as ignoring and overlooking the nature of the threat, the gravitational force that is emanating out of the Indian subcontinent, which now has coalesced into a macro a Al Qaeda organization, and here I was back 10 years ago warning the US government of the threat of this group. And my case was shut down, and I was investigated nine times. My gun was taken from me, my secret clearance was revoked, all access to the systems were removed. I was sequestered for the last 11 months with no assigned duties while I was under investigation from the Department of Justice who were seeking to find probable cause to indict me and put me in jail for the violation of the civil rights and civil liberties and or the privacy rights of foreign nationals. The second investigation was Internal Affairs, Custom and Border Protection and the third investigation was the, uh, the Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security, all three at the same time. That's how I ended my career. I was able to retire, thanks to the Lord about that. And now I'm here standing before you. I saw it. I saw it from inside the federal government in the same way that Osama and, my, and Annie saw it from their world where they came from. We're all telling you the same thing. Am I making my point? So I'm going to leave with, or finish up with an allegory. Imagine this whole room here is a big swimming pool. And there are 192 sponges floating around in the swimming pool. I think that's the number of the countries in the world. Let's just say 200 sponges. Each one is a country floating around in the water. What, what is the natural thing that's going to happen when sponges float around in water? Water saturates into them, right? These sponges are all a little different. And the other thing that you should know when I ask you the final question, which is the final question, what can we do? You cannot take the sponges out of the water. Because why? Because the water is the world that we live in. So the sponges are floating around, bumping into each other, and water is soaking into them in various rates, some faster and some slower. Some sponges are already super saturated and are basically about to sink. If you don't happen to be satisfied with the rate of uh, saturation from the water coming from underneath, what are you going to do to speed up the process? You're going to push on the sponge from above. That's terrorism. That's a tactic. The other form of saturation was the water coming from up. That's the Muslim Brotherhood. Saturation from underneath up. Whereas Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hezbollah, Hamas are pushing the sponge from the top. That's why they won't condemn each other. Because they all know that the tactics are different, but the strategy is exactly the same. To saturate the sponge with Sharia. So here's the $64,000 question. I think with inflation, it's probably like, you know, $80,000 question now. How do you waterproof the sponge? Remembering that you can't take it out of the water. So how do you waterproof the sponge? More fundamental than that. You can actually waterproof the sponge without having a border wall. It is actually possible to protect the sovereignty our, with our country without a physical border. But it can't, isn't possible unless every from, everybody from baby to grandpa is involved in the process. Remember kindergarten cop? Stranger, stranger. If everybody is involved in the process, we don't actually need a, def, a, a physical wall as much as we need to go back to find the answer to the question that I ask you. What? Set what waterproofs the sponge. And now we're back where we started. What are you fighting for? The Constitution. It's the Constitution that waterproofs the sponge. At that point, it doesn't matter what tactic is used to try to saturate the sponge. If the sponge is waterproofed, 
the Constitution protects us and those endowed liberties that we receive more powerfully than any kind of physical wall. And my second homework assignment as I, we will close is that whatever arena that you happen to work in, whether it's the, the um, civil, I mean the political arena, the social arena, the law enforcement, that whatever position you take going now, including all the organizations that are representative, you need to be able to cite literally chapter and verse from the Constitution when you go into the arena and challenge the status quo. You have to be able to point back to the Constitution and say, according to Article 6, the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land and the judges of each state are bound thereby. Period which means Sharia law is illegal in the United States. Flat bottom line. What constitutes the waterproofing of the sponge is the U.S. Constitution. And of course it goes without saying that the U.S. Constitution, and here's an irony, is saturated with biblical principles. And that will also help waterproof the sponge. So if you're on the faith side of the equation, you don't have to worry about violating your principles of faith because the Constitution is saturated with biblical principles. If you're not on the faith side of the, of the equation, you can still be a valiant defender of the Constitution and help protect our country from threat, both foreign and domestic. How many have taken the vow? Either, either in the law enforcement, military, or public office. Does any of you who have ever taken the vow here feel like your vow is retired, even though you might be? Nor do I, and that's why I'm standing here. I took the vow to help protect our country from threat, both foreign and domestic, and protect the Constitution, and right in the vow is the answer to the question. And if you've never taken the vow in law enforcement and or military and or political office, I don't want you to feel left out. Because you, in your heart, right now or tomorrow or the next day, can take the vow to help protect our country from threat, both foreign and domestic, and get into the fight, which, is it, which it is. Our forefathers had to make the same choices, and they made them. And that's why we're here today. And our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren are going to ask, what did you do back in 2017 when we began to realize that there was an emerging threat? What did you, Papa? What did you, Grandpa and Grandma? And you need to be able to tell them, well, I did this, and I did that, and I did the other thing, and son or daughter or grandma or grandson or granddaughter, it was all based on the Constitution. And I want you, son or daughter or granddaughter, to carry on my tradition of the example that I set. We all need to be able to do that. And with that, even though I could go on for a month, because I have lots of things to tell you, I'm going to stop because I think it's time for questions.